Welcome everyone, Costine here with my campaign overview guide for Marafi of the Dark Elves, who has one of the easiest campaign starts in the game, I would say, and actually quite a lot of campaign potential as well. Now, if we're looking at her faction effects, she basically gains Slanishy Corruption and also can recruit Demonettes. She also, she also gets a hero action cost reduction, which doesn't matter. She gets a construction cost benefit for sorcery buildings, doesn't matter. The Sonashi Corruption benefit, however, is enormously significant, far more so than one might necessarily realize over here from the very start. If it, you're just starting turn one, you might not realize why this is significant, but there's two reasons for it. First off, the Sonashi Corruption at the start, at the relatively low level, will give you some benefit from income with slaves. But here's the thing. When you get to a very high level, you're gaining five control and additional benefits to income from saves and slave capacity. Marafi thus has the best land-based economy of of the Dark Elves. Because while Lokir may gain a lot of money from uh, from sacking and looting settlements, you'll actually generate a ridiculous amount of money as Marafi. The benefits that she's gaining over here, the control benefit, basically nullifies the slave situation, the slave control situation that you're going to encounter in any Dark Elf camp campaign, even at the camp. Because 5 control is actually more than even the highest possible level of slaves, I think. Is. Or very, very, or basically it's the same, anyway. There's another benefit with Salinity Corruption, beyond the economic benefit, the control benefit, and of course the fact that Corruption itself will deal damage to armies that are moving in your territory. You won't take that damage with any army you're having, but other armies will. There's another benefit as well. Though it, it, it does have a bit of a, uh, of a downside, but I'd say overall it's a benefit. So, you have the control building over here. The difference between Morafi's control building and the control building other people have is that her control building gives her the ability of recruiting demonettes and exalted demonettes. I don't care the demonettes, but the thing is, this control building, which you generally would want to build as the uh, as the Dark Elves, will also increase your death hack capacity. Which is great because death hags give you replenishment, which you want. They're not necessarily the best heroes, but they're a pretty solid melee choice and that replenishment does matter. The downside, of course, is that you're not necessarily going to get the same canine assassin hero capacity as some other factions. But you, but you don't really care about canine assassins because they're just not really great heroes. In fact, I would dare say they're the worst heroes of the Dark Elven roster. Decent enough, I suppose, but not something to cry over the fact that you're going to have fewer in a campaign as Marafi. Besides, this building chain is kind of worthless in a lot of ways. Because Harganef executioners don't really work all that well. Canite assassins aren't too important. So just having death hags associated with your control building, which you want to build regardless, just gives you a lot more death hags in your campaign. And it's also generating quite a lot of corruption. Also in other provinces. Your neighbors might not like you for that. So that's, those are some of the significant benefits of Marathi. Now, as for her skill line, she gets a loyalty benefit to lords in her region, a cooldown benefit to sacrifice to Hakarti, and a slave cost to that sacrifice as well. Now, sacrifice to Hakarti is not something I care about at all. Like, if I'm using slaves, I'm not using six, 400 slaves for just a, an experience benefit for sorcerers and supreme sorceresses. I mean, supreme sorceresses can be great, but to be honest, as the Dark Elves, I would not necessarily bother with them because there is a better lore choice in, uh, in the Dreadlords with either, uh, with either the Sword and Crossbow or the Dreadlord with Sword and Shield. Hell, you could even argue the Beastmaster if you're going to go for beasts. Like, it, like if you can get ma magic easily, and you can as the Dark Elves, there's no point in getting magic lords. Because they won't have the same melee capacity, and having that uh, same melee ability as uh, as a kind of, um, as the regular melee lords uh, do have. So, there, the right is kind of pointless. That said, you do, uh, and the thing is the Dark Elves is you can increase your hero capacity at tier 3 for basically all your heroes. Actually, your masters can be increased at tier 2. That is actually a substantial uh, benefit uh, when it comes down to it. But in terms of your special skill line, well, you have two, uh, two choices. You can either go Insidious or you can go Tenacious. Now, let's look at these two skill lines and let's talk about it. So... Insidious gives you hero crew ramp for Canite assassins, 
doesn't really matter. Campaign movement range for all characters, that's pretty useful, admittedly. Melee benefits for shades. Um, and also embedded uh, heroes. That can be great, the hero benefit, as well as the lords in the region. So basically, you're buffing... Uh, you're you're buffing other armies that are close to Morafi. So if you're running with two stacks, the thing about it though, it doesn't really work out because when you're playing as Morafi, each individual army of the Dark Elves is pretty damn powerful. Very rarely, and only against exceptional foes, will you actually have two armies together. But then those two armies should be able to deal with it. So it's good, but a bit pointless in some ways. I mean, if you're really fighting a lot of foes, and yes, if you have a lot of heroes, that can be great, but um, the shade benefit is not really significant, because shades should not fight in melee, they should fight in ranged. Then you get the control benefit, the Solenshi corruption benefit, and reducing enemy leadership. There's some benefits here, but I do prefer tenacious. You're getting more casualties post-battle loot, so that means more slaves, more income post-battle loot, so more money, casualty replenishment, ward save, unit experience, uh, diplomatic relations with Beastmen and Norska, kind of pointless, but Slanishy Corruption in all provinces, and a significant upkeep benefit for Morafi's army. Now, if not for that 30% upkeep, I would probably say Insidious is the better choice. Not necessarily all that great, though. But having a 30% upkeep benefit, having an attrition benefit, having 5% ward save, and 6% casualty replenishment, and a unit experience benefit is all very substantial. Basically, it means Marafi's army is going to be very powerful, very difficult to take down. And that's, by the way, what makes her campaign easier. So I would argue Tenacious is the better choice out of the two. Now, out of her other skills, she does get a flying mount option. She does get a Hecarfi's uh, Blessing, which gives you a Winds of Magic Power Reserve all armies faction-wide. Now, as for the other skills here, not necessarily that important with the exception of the first sorceress uh, over here and oh, of course blessing by evil the thing is with morafi and this is one of the things i will argue about her she can be a good caster but really what morafi is and one of the things you shouldn't never underestimate she is a really powerful melee lord not necessarily the top tier but she certainly has a great deal of combat ability like look at it she gets regeneration ward save like, just having 20% ward save, she is really good. So, wasting your skill points, this is the problem a lot of the hybrid lords have. It's like, yeah, you can buff their magic, absolutely. But is it really worth to buff their magic when it comes down to it? Uh, when it comes down to it, when you can buff their melee ability. And when you have 20% ward save, that is pretty substantial. But that's up to you, really. I would personally buff up her melee ability before buffing up her magic ability. Maybe don't devote uh, too much effort to... Like, that's the thing. You always want to get the army uh, army buffs for obvious reasons. You want to get some points in the blue skill line because you want the income from sacking settlements. Um, and, you, uh, and you do want to get the upkeep benefit here because that can be pretty substantial. Quartermaster as well can be really good uh, to have. So, you always want... A good portion of the blue skill line, a good portion of the red skill line. You obviously get the special skills. Granted, Marafi doesn't necessarily have... Um, well, actually, she does, because if we're counting the ones here. So you're not, you're just not going to have the skills. You then have a choice. Either dedicate yourself to the melee line or dedicate yourself to the magic line. Doing both is not going to work out. That's your call. Personally, prefer melee line and to get the sorceress to support her. Not that Marafi will need the sorceress for a lot of her early game. Okay, so th that's her Morafi. lord effects that she has. A good amount of power, though, of course, having a hyper lord is not necessarily great, but she does have a great deal of melee uh, potential. But also a good deal of magical potential, but you're not going to be struggling to get sorceresses as, uh, as heroes to support your armies. Certainly not. Now, uh, about your campaign plan. The H Dark Elven faction you start at war with here only has this one army. And it has four regions to begin with. You take down this army. At the end of the turn, they're obviously going to recruit a lord somewhere here. 
one of these two settlements, maybe even in Grey Rock Point. Obviously, you take down this army, you take the settlement, you fight those battles manually. Be, be careful with the Witch Elves. They can take a lot of damage. You use the Dread Spears to take uh, to take the damage. I used to do range damage and use these guys as flankers. Actually, I would personally use Morafi as... Um, I would personally use Morafi as a distraction uh, in, in battles. Now, uh, you take the Petrified Forest. And here you're going to have to make a choice in your campaign. There is one that I think is better than the alternative, but when you do decide what you're going to do on turn two, either taking Grey Rock Point or going for Tor, you, it's going to be dependent on what you've decided to do, which direction you've decided to go on your campaign map. You can either go west or you can go east. Overall. Like, if you want to go east, you take Iron Spike, you take these settlements, then you take Grey Rock Point as your final settlement. If you're going west, you take Iron Spike last. Now, let's talk about the situation, the overall diplomatic situation. You start next to Mazdamun. You have a non-aggression pack, but he has a minus 40 uh, aversion against you. So you're quite likely to end up in a war with him unless you do something like this. Though this is not recommended. Skeggy will be a genuine f uh, issue um, in your campaign. But basically, you want to be able to maintain a good diplomatic relation with Mazamundi. Because here's what Mazamundi will do in virtually every campaign. Maybe in some situations you might need to help him out, but in virtually every campaign I've played on Legendary very hard, he always does the same thing. He wipes out this Lanshi faction. He will do it slowly. Bear in mind this. This is the thing about Mazamundi. He'll waste a lot of turns doing this, so he's not going to be a threat for many turns. But he will wipe out the Salenshi faction slowly, then he'll wipe out Skeggy slowly and take all of all that you see here and the Isthmus. And then he may end up being faction strength number one because he has several provinces, uh, including all the way over here to the swamps because he's going to end up at war with the Blue Vipers. He takes all of this territory, he, became, he becomes a major power. And one of the things I've realized, because I did a campaign gun, an early campaign gun for Marafi, one of the things I've realized is, yes, the aversion is a nuisance, but you do want an alliance with Mazda Mundi. Because, one, he can be really powerful and a useful ally once he sorts out his situation. Two, you don't want to end up having to go into Lustria as Marafi because the territory is not, uh, not suitable. And that's the thing. How do you avoid that, though? Well, you take Iron Spike, and then you find yourself in this particular province. There's some beastmen over here, uh, and there's Skaven that control most of the Ashen Coast as well as the Iron Sand Desert. Now, this is a minor Skaven faction. It's not a major Skaven faction. Major Skaven factions are a genuine pain in the neck to deal with early on in your campaign. Minor Skaven factions, they're easy to deal with. Very easy. So you take Morafi, you take the Petrified Forest, you recruit two Dark Shards over here because you start with the ability of recruiting them at Tier 1. You start getting the Holes of Mustering. Uh, you, on turn two, you take Grey Rock Point with Marafi. You recruit a second Lord over here in the Petrified Forest. Yes, you will use that second Lord. And re you recruit two units of Dark Shards on that. That's base, That second Lord is to prevent any counterattack from, uh, from the Dark Elves here if they do decide to launch it. Though they won't have units for those first two turns, so they won't do so. By the way, that's what you do. You take Rain Rock Point, you you then force March Morafi over here to, or, or rather, you take your army from the Petrified Forest, you attack the settlement, you force March Morafi to support that army, you may even transfer in the entire all of the units in Morafi's army to that army, because Morafi's army is going to be in Force March, but the army here is not. So just bear that in mind. You take the settlement, you take Iron Spike. Then you declare war on the Skaven. You take out... Um, uh, you take out these elements. Now, be careful about the Skaven, because one of the things they can do is use the Underway, and they can always sneak around. So one of the things you might want to do is actually put Morafi in an ambush stance as you're advancing in their territory. But you also want to take this territory quick, quick over here. Now, you just... Uh, your second army should... Uh, by this point, you should get the ability of getting two Masters in your campaign, because you start with one hero capacity, obviously, and you get, will get a, an additional hero capacity, so you will be able to get two. You always want your second army, uh, you want your army, uh, second army to recruit a bunch of dark shards with shields and turn those over to Morafi. Until Morafi has a full stack. A combination of Dread Spears, dark shards, and dark shards with shields, along with the starting units. You might even want to throw the demonets out the window, as far as I'm concerned. You also get a bunch of regiments in Renown if you have the DLC. 
I'm obviously making these videos on Legendary very hard with the DLC concert. I'm not going to play the game of like, oh, what about lower difficulties? What about not having DLC? I'm sorry. There's a lot of uh, complexities in these games as they are. If you don't own the DLC, obviously things are going to be different. If you don't own regiments around, it will affect your campaign. Though it's not necessarily a big issue. Regiments right now are more of an emergency recruitment situation. Though there is a Dark Shard Mother regiment right now that you might want to use. Either way, with a more full stack under Morafi and just Morafi, your secondary army should be moving here because they're going to need to adopt the defensive posture. You take Tyrant's Peak, you take the Skaven, you take the Beastmen. If the Beastmen are near Tyrant's Peak, you declare war on them, you fight everything the Skaven have to offer, you advance an ambush stance, you take this territory over here. What you're doing at the same time as you're taking this territory is like once you're moving from the settlement, you sell it to Mazdamundi. Once you move from Iron Spike, you're out of the region. You sell it to Mazdamundi. You get military access. You get the defensive alliance. You get the military alliance. It might take you the entire province to get the military alliance. It might not necessarily be beneficial to get the military alliance very quickly. Because when Mazdamundi declares war on factions, you may not want to get involved in that. Specifically, he will declare war on the New World Colonies, you might not want to get involved in that particular mess, especially since they can and will launch a naval invasion of your territory if they think they can get away with it. It's lovely when the AI marches across an entire province just to attack you, because screw you, you're the player. Anyway, you deal with the Skaven. Try not letting any Skaven army to bypass you. That's the reason your second lord should stay on the defensive, because the Skaven, the Beastmen, may just run in circles around you and raise your territory and your core territory. Don't want that to happen. You want to be recruiting Dark Shards. Another thing you want to do, by the way, in your core territory, you want to get your... Uh, you don't want to destroy any structure over here, though you might be tempted to. But you don't want to, because the growth here is great. You need a unit recruitment too. But one of the things you want to do is you want to get the settlement here to tier 2 very quickly. And you want to get uh, the slave pens very quickly. Once that's done, you recruit a Black Ark. And you start pumping up Black Ark Corsairs while you're recruiting Dark Shards with shields in your army you recruit two full stacks over here. Or at least a full stack on the Black Ark early on when you're struggling for money, when you may not have it. You recruit a full stack that you put on the Black Ark itself because that Black Ark has a minus 50% upkeep benefit. Now, you don't do anything with that second army unless you see an opportunity for it. That's the thing. There will be opportunities presented, but let me just finish what I'm talking about, Marath. You move over here, you sell all this territory to Mazamundi. You'll be at the Rice, uh, Ice Rock Gorge over here. You'll also have, by this point, most likely a second, uh, a second full stack under a Black Arc. Now, depending on how risky you want to play it, um, you, can either con uh, you can either take the Bleak Coast or you can use Morafi to take the Doomglades. Now, the faction here... Starts at war with the petition. sisters of Ariel. Now, you will get good diplomatic relations with them passively. And by, by the time you arrive, if you're playing on Legendary very hard, they'll be in deep trouble. They might still hold their, their capital. The sisters don't necessarily have the capacity of easily taking that capital. But they'll lose the other settlements. They'll lose their army. So they might just be willing to desperately confederate with you. By the way... When it comes to diplomatic relations, Dragon. you don't make deals with the Bleak Holds, you don't wow, make deals with the, uh, crack, uh, the Coven, you ignore every other faction basically be beyond Hexwattle mm -hmm. and Dragon. maybe Clan Karan because, yeah, okay. screw Tarox more or less. Like, you can you can get some money from these okay. guys by non-aggression pact, trade agreements, all that. Like, these are the only guys you make deals with. You ignore the Bleak Hold Coast because you want to take them over from military force. Now... Let's talk a bit about the situation in this particular province. It's a great province as well. Vulnerable, of course, to Ulfa. Um, these guys are at war with Skeggy. So they're going to send their armies via the sea to attack Skeggy. They're going to have a full stack, at the very least, though, to defend their territory. The Moonshard is vulnerable to a naval invasion. And let me be blunt, Black Heart Corsairs are capable of tearing to shreds any other unit early on. In a Dark Elven roster. That's why you want to get the Black Ark very, very quickly. Get the slave pen building, get it quickly. Spend all your slaves if you have to do it. But take that quickly. Um, and take the Moon Shard. Then um, you might want to transfer the units from the Black Ark to your secondary land army and set an ambush for them. Because you want their army to move from their. Uh, capital over here. You may you also be careful with the, your black arc itself 
because if you lose that, you're going to lose your Black Heart Corsair recruitment. You will be able to get it back, but it does suck to lose it for a couple of turns. Also will affect your growth. But if you can get the army to march out of here, or we can just directly assault it. It's not too difficult to assault. Um, uh, it, it, it may not necessarily be too difficult to assault, though it's worth keeping in mind that this is not a Dark Elven Settlement, it's a High Elven Settlement. And High Elven Settlements are an absolute fucking nightmare to assault with range units, but you should have enough Black Heart Corsairs to force the issue if it comes down to it. So, that's the kind of situation you might have. If you really want to, if you're struggling with that, you might send Morafi over here, uh, who's going to be over here to just wipe them out from the north. Bear in mind that isn't an ideal scenario. Like, the ideal scenario is your secondary army and your black heart manage to do this on their own. They may struggle to. Depends on how your situation is. Things may go badly. If they do, you go over here. Now, here you have a choice when you find yourself here. What I'd recommend here is you try and avoid the war with Katep, though Mazamundi may declare what that. Katep himself may declare on Maz Mazamundi, but generally speaking, Katep doesn't like the Sisters of Twilight. They don't like him. They're likely going to end up in a war with each other. Or Katep may struggle to eliminate these Greenskins very quickly uh, in his campaign, and he then will have Grum Brindle, actually, to deal with. So, my recommendation, you go to war with the Sisters of Twilight. They have a good we defeat rate. That, well, not necessarily a great defeat rate, but it's pretty decent. But you take this entire province. If you can get Hack Hole with Confederation so it's a higher level, that's great. If you have to burn it, to, if you have to sack it and take it by force, do so. You sack the Witchwood. You sack the Witchwood because it's a ridiculous level of money, like 10k at tier 2 or something like that. You sack the Witchwood, you sell that to Katep. Mazamundi's territory should span all the way to here. He, the territory is not necessarily great for him, but it will get the job done. The of course. Don't, uh, frozen territory is not too great. It is really bad for him, though. Supreme so you'll have... So instead of wasting Morafi's army to take the Bleak Coast, you want to take the Doomglades, you want to take the Witchwood. Can you defeat the Sisters of Twilight with just a stack of Dread Spears, two Shades, some Witch Elves, if you still have them, uh, by this point in Morafi's army, if you haven't given them up to the secondary army and just got them uh, Dark Shards and Dark Shards with Shields? Yes, you can. As stated, Morafi is pretty damn powerful. You might even get a master if you confederate these guys, because uh, they might have a master. They might even uh, they, they might have an, a master hero lying around here. And that's what happened in a campaign I played recently. The master can obviously be useful, so you might have two masters by this point in Morafi's army. Now with the sisters, they may have two full stacks by this point, or they may have nothing. It's hard to predict sometimes. When I dealt with them in a recent campaign, they had two full stacks, but I didn't have to face them both at the same time. The sisters are powerful, but the thing is, they're not... It would take it will take them some time to actually grow, because it just takes too many turns for them. Like, This is one of the problems with the Wood Elf AI. Generally speaking, the AI cheats on legendary difficulty, right? And gets settlements to a high level very quickly because they just get the growth to do so. Well, the Wood Elves are not tied to growth. They just start building settlements, but it takes quite a few turns to do so. So they're unlikely to have higher anything higher than a tier 2 settlement by the time you arrive. That means they're not going to have Treekin. That means the Hawk Riders are going to be limited. You're basically going to be dealing with a, a basic army of some... of some melee units and glade guard and while glade guard are powerful and the sisters are powerful your dark shards with shields can take the damage morafi can dance in circles around them and you can win the fight now let me just talk a bit about quests very quickly here because this is important there's a quest there's three quest items there's only one quest battle and it's really really easy to be very blunt about it like this item but then there's two other missions. One basically requires you to get a sorcerer uh, tower. So you just get this element to tier 3 and you build this. You get the sorcerer. Big deal. You get the item. And money. And temporary casualty replenishment. Another one requires you to get 5,000 battle captives. You'll do that naturally for the course of your campaign. Post battle options when it comes to every battle you fight in a campaign should always be to try and take slaves unless you're at the cap. When you're taking a settlement, even if you suffer the dip, even if you're looting and occupying it, if you don't have enough movement points to sack it and then uh, go and take it over in the same turn, you just uh, loot and occupy it. Yes, the p control penalty does suck, but you want the slaves. 
You want the slaves, you want to achieve the objectives, you want to get the benefits the slaves give you. You want to have them for rights. You want them to fuel your economy over here. Now, that does mean you may not get a lot of economic buildings. Bear in mind, you do have a growth building over here in the Petrified Forest. Don't... Uh, don't just, uh, like, that. this might be the one exception where you really don't want to sack it. You might have enough How movement scheming. points to just uh, sack it and come and occupy it, but you don't want to do so because you want to take the Dark Elf Manors here. And in general, you're not really going to be able to do this so in your initial province with sacking and occupying. You might do it in Iris Pike and, and some other uh, territories. Depends on how many movement points you have. You have good control, remember this. Because between the Salenshi corruption uh, that you have, the diktats, all that. So you eliminate the witch, uh, Sisters of Twilight, you sell the Witchwood to Katep. Uh, you should build the barracks, by the way, before you sell it to Katep, because that's going to increase the value he's going to place on the transaction. You're not going to get a lot of money from Katep for that, because he doesn't have a lot of money to begin with. But if you just build a barracks over here at Tier 1, and, and this applies to any faction, if you're building a barracks and a settlement before you're selling it to that faction, they'll value that more. Now, I'm not saying you should always sell settlements with barracks in them. That's far from the case. You actually want your allies to be useful, not just giving them an entire province of four regions like this one to Mazamundi, each of which with the barracks. No, you want to give them economic buildings. You want to actually make use of those to be more useful as allies. I feel some people really underestimate the value of allies. If you're hoping your allies are going to be winning the campaign for you, yes, be prepared to be disappointed. But if you're hoping your allies can actually give you some value, can be good trading partners, what can help you out militarily, and maybe you use the allegiance system, yeah, there's value in that, especially in a long campaign. Some people are like, oh, I'll just fight the entire campaign on my own. Diplomacy can be powerful. Like, let's say you give an ally a province on your border territory with a hostile faction where you don't want to expand. Well, they'll hold them back for you. They won't necessarily succeed in conquering territory, but they'll hold them back for you. So anyway, you take the entire province here of the Doomglades. You either march directly from Hackhog to the Witchwood and then go... Um, or you go for Vault's Anvil, you take the uh, the temple here and then take the, the which would be a concern about Tarax because if he raises the temple over here to the ground, you will not be able to reoccupy the pro uh, reoccupy it until you deal with his Hearthstone, which he will set, uh, put here. Then you move over here in this province. Now, the Obsidian Peaks is an annoying province to deal with because you're going to have to spend money to recolonize these elements since Tarax is just going to burn it all to the ground. But is money well spent? Either because you hold the province for yourself and you get significant benefits. These provinces are four regions. Like, there's resources here. Timber, furs, there's a special structure over here. Or, at this point, you'll encounter Malakif. You sell it to Malakif. Now, Silostra is generally going to take the Circle of Destruction. That's what I've noticed on my campaigns. When you arrive here, you might be really, really tempted to declare war on Silostra. There's a bit of a problem with that. Malekith won't necessarily appreciate that. Because Silostra is likely going to end up in a war with Alifanar. Malekith hates Alifanar. So if you declare war on Silostra, you might end up in a war with Malekith, which is obviously something you want to avoid. You want to come over here. You want to take this territory. All of these provinces. That's what you're going to be doing for a lot of the early game. Just advancing north. Now, of course, people will ask the obvious question. Well, what about the n ticking time bomb that is Ulf one? The factions here in, in Hexawat and next to Hexawatl shouldn't be an issue, even if they attack. Well, here's the thing. Your secondary army and your Black Ark army should have taken this entire province. Once they do, you have some choices to make. But the choices you make regarding Ulf one come down to what's happening in Ulf one, And that's difficult to predict because I've seen it go in numerous ways. Generally speaking, though, uh, broadly speaking, though, the thing I notice happening on Legendary very hard in virtually every campaign is that for the first 20, 30 turns or so, Noctilus and Akari tend to win against Old One. They will especially do this on Legendary very hard. If you set the difficulty to low, they won't do so well. And that's like, this is the kind of campaign where playing on Legendary is actually hugely beneficial to you because you have all the tools you need to annihilate all the factions that you start next to. Um, but, and if you're setting on Legendary very hard and fighting all the battles manually, that's actually going to benefit Noctilus and Nakari. Because here's the thing if you set to a lower difficulty, they're going to be too cautious. And the thing is, being cautious doesn't suit them because them being cautious just benefits Tyrion and Alarial. That's the thing about the High Elves. They start weak, but they get really powerful. The more time is spent, 
buy them in terms of expansion. Like the best situation for you is if Noctilus takes both Terranok and Kalidor and puts a lot of pressure on Tyrion. And if Nakari can take both Katik and Kris. You don't want to make diplomatic deals with, uh, with uh, Nakari, by the way, or Noctilus. Because you're going to want to wipe them out, by the way. You're going to want all of Wolf 1 to your, for yourself. You're greedy like that. Um, now, you could argue, some people could argue, well, you could be very aggressive and just invade Wolf 1 with Marafi quickly. I would say dealing with Alarial, Tyrion, and Alfarian early on in the campaign is a bit of a suicidal wish. On top of that, you're not necessarily going to benefit from that because you do want to get good relations with Malika for the Confederation purposes in your campaign. And you also want to come here north anyway because your victory condition requires you to kill Halibron. I don't know why this victory condition exists, but you do want to achieve it. I have to say, having to pick a fight with Halibron is not my idea of a good time. I actually dread that more than dealing with Ulf One. By the way, by the point you even reach Obsidian Peaks, you should have taken the Bleak Coast. One way or another. Even if you have to send Morafi on a bit of a detour to take them out, you do so and then you march north again with her. Now with your Black Ark and your secondary army, you have a choice. You should have a lot of money by this point. You should be able to start recruiting a third army or yeah, a third army over here to defend this province, just for defensive purposes. What you decide to do at this stage while Morafi is busy conquering these territories, getting diplomatic relations with Malekif, maybe starting to build an army over here in the Claude Coast to just to annihilate Hellebrand. Don't fight Hellebrand with just one army. She'll always have two free stacks to deal with you. And while she's not as powerful as Morafi, she will throw a lot of dark shards against you. So be careful about that because I've made the mistake of underestimating what Hellebrand can do when I was playing a Leaf and I've got to tell you, I paid that price. So don't make that mistake. If you're invading Hellebron's territory, you bring overwhelming force, or at least two full stacks to deal with that. You do have a choice with your secondary army and your first Black Ark, though. And this depends solely on what's happening in Ulf 1. If Noctilus and Nakari are doing well, here's what you do. You take them by the coast, you ignore Kalidor, you don't declare war on Tyrion. You don't want to make any deal with Noctilus and Akari for the reason that they're going to be at war with Alarial and Tyrion very quickly. And if you make diplomatic deals with them, which you can, that's just going to make sure Tyrion and Alarial declare war on you quickly, which you don't want. In fact, you may want to avoid that for a while. You don't want to invade Ulfwan too quickly because you want to uh, first establish a military alliance with Malekith, then declare war on them while also having a military alliance with Hexamatol and Katep because that way when you're fighting them, your diplomatic relations are going to increase. But here's the thing. If Noctilus and Akari have done well in their early game, you go, you, you, you go the very aggressive route. You take a full stack on a Black Art, you take a full stack on a proper army, you bring heroes. You should have death hags by this point. You should have enough masters for all of them. You should have sorceresses over here. You take all of that and you beeline for Lawford. Nothing else matters. You attack Lawford. It should be a tier 3 settlement. Very well. But the question of whether or not you can take Lawford depends on the following point. Is Tyrion's army going to be there? If it's there, you're not going to be able to take it easily. You might still be able to achieve a win with two full stacks, but... A full, a full stack under Tyrion with the garrison of Lafern is a hard sell. Hell, the garrison of Lafern alone is a hard fight because the defensive of Lof, uh, defenses of Lafern, the layout of the city is going to be difficult. What you want to build, by the way, Dark Shards, Black Art Corsairs, get heroes, get some siege as well. Some siege engines. You may not necessarily need them, dependent on the situation. But you bring those stacks, like stacks of black art corsairs and dark shards in particular you attack lawfern you take it if you manage to take it and you don't sack it you just take it or loot and occupy it because you want to preserve its level if you manage to take it and you have a black art army in its port and a regular army just outside then when Tyrion counterattacks, he won't be able to win with just one army he is ridiculously powerful but you won't be able to do so Though, of course, actually conquering Wolf 1 with your secondary armies while your main army is away is a really hard sell. You should only do it if you're feeling comfortable. 
What you may want to do instead is you march that Black Ark army to support Morafi, you deal with Halibron, you conquer that territory, then you invade from the north with overwhelming force. Now, that's the campaign plan, and you do need to eliminate the other High Elven factions. Now, I want to just show you a particular campaign that I've been playing on Legendary. 37 turns in, how this can go. So here we are, Heart at the Shrine. There are no mods with the exception of Toggle Fog of War and Autresolve Quest Battles. The Toggle Fog of War is causing some issues over here. So I'll just, it can cause some problems if you have a toggle that, uh, uh, if you may toggle Master it at the end turn, which I did to see the situation. So here's what, I'm, what I've got on my hands here. I've got three armies. I built this one, recruiting locally and with the Black Ark. Tyrion is defeated. He tried to take back Lothurn after I conquered it. He's defeated. I have three armies. Alariel has two. Thankfully, in this situation, she has the Sword of Cain. If she, it, it, she doesn't have the Sword of Cain. If she had the Sword of Cain, I would never pick, pick this fight. She does have a lot of Treekin, so that's going to be a bit difficult. But I do have two full stacks over here. I have heroes. These lords aren't necessarily at the highest possible level, but... I think with three armies I can defeat Alariel and then turn turn those armies around to deal with, the, with this force. Alariel is actually our biggest friend, not Tyrion, because while Tyrion's own combat potential is formidable, he can't recruit Trekin. Alariel can and will recruit Trekin. And I've talked about how ridiculously strong those guys are. That's one of the problems in invading Old Fun. Now over here, you can see the Slanshi corruption and what it does. Slave income from slaves, slaves per turn. Faction slave capacity. This is, by the way, per province and all the provinces that I have. Mazdamundi has his territory. Um, Katep has the Witchwood. He's got this entire province. He's at war with Grom Brindle, but so is Malik. I don't have time for words. Though, oddly enough, Malakith did not declare war quick, as quickly as I would have imagined. I'm fact faction strength number one, by the way. I took over this entire province, but because I declared war on Silostra before declaring war on Leifanar, Malekith did not like that. So I actually had to sell him the Obsidian Peaks to avoid a war with him. It's stupid, oh, it's ridiculous, and for whatever reason, Leifanar did not take Karen Carr, or the, rather the Black Light Tower, but it is a bit ridiculous. Um, I do have two other armies over here, and I can afford these. The reason I've got these armies is because uh, Noctilus took Tyrannoch, so I sent when I saw that I sent these two arm these two over here. But then I then Alariel came here with a full stack. She sent those armies over here in the inner sea, but she took uh, she sent here a full stack. So these were basically emergency recruited to basically stop Alariel from curb stomping the garrisons of the Bleak Coast. Or to slow her down if it came down to it. This is a risky proposition and it's kind of best case scenario you might achieve in the campaign. But you do get a lot of money from the quest battle, so you can afford a lot of this stuff early on. Uh, you all, uh, And those quests are easy. The quest battle she has is really easy. If you have the auth-resolve quest battle mod, you'll be able to auth-resolve it with like the army she has over here. Like, I just have two masters, the Canite Assassin she starts with, the Shade she starts with, the Regiment Renown bunch of dark shards I recruited early on and dark shards with shields of course and I've been able to defeat everyone that stands in my way with relative ease I do have obviously a bit of a problem over here with Mr. Ali Fanar, but I think I can take his uh, his army over here though of course it probably is time to get some support for Morafi and just recruit another lord so what what am I going to do in this situation defeat Alariel Stabilize the situation here. Not necessarily go after Alariel. I want to take down... Well, Everest has actually fallen. This is the thing about difficulty settings. If you're playing on a high difficulty... Like, Alfarian will annihilate Nakari in the long term. But because I destroyed Tyrion, Tyrion wasn't able to defeat Nakari or Noctilus. 
Like, Noctilus, at the point I took Lawfarin, was on the verge of just getting wiped out, basically. Because Illyri between Illyrial's armies, Tyrion's armies, he would have certainly gotten wiped out, and then Tyrion and Illyrial would have just curb-stomped Nakari. So, uh, that, like, turn 30 is really the point where you want to intervene in Wolf 1 in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't have to be with Morafi or substantial forces, but right now I have five stacks aimed at Wolf 1, basically, more or less. That's how much I consider them a major problem. Like, everything that's going on here is secondary. I mean, Morafi can handle her, this on her own. And this is the thing to also know. Your legendary Lord they army is your most powerful glory. army. It's got the most combat power. It's going to have the most experienced units. It's capable of fighting two free stacks on its own. Of any kind. Your secondary like armies old. aren't as experienced. Though, in this case, these guys do have Not. a good amount of experience. That's because the masters uh, that are providing... Master uh, rather, the master here that's providing uh, training over here. And also growth. Drew that's the thing about ability. masters. But yeah, it's a bit of a delicate situation. But what one of the things to know in any campaign is... Your main army can Not handle old. a lot more yeah. things than your secondary and tertiary army can't. Like, if I invade the Moravia, I could have taken Lawfarin with just her. I had to send two full stacks over here to do so in her absence. It's not an ideal situation, but this can be considered the most ideal outcome. Now, this may not happen for a number of reasons. You may end up in a war with Katep because he might declare it on you or Mazda Mundi. You can avoid it on you, Salem the Witchwood, but... Diplomatic relations between various factions can be finicky. You might get invaded by a lot of the factions here. You might get the Slanishi faction declaring war on you, the New World Colonies declaring war on you, and invading your territory. So you need to adopt a defensive po posture here and seize the opportunities as they come. That's all. Costine here signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.